Japanese swords like this antique katana used by samurai during the feudal era get plenty of attention. But what we're going to look at here are the pole weapons, the pole arms used during the time of the samurai. Hi folks, I'm Matt Easton of Scholar Galantore and this video today is brought to you thanks to World of Warships. And we're going to be looking at the much neglected topic of Japanese pole arms. In many periods, the main weapon, very often these swords, which are so famous and so beloved of movies and video games, were often backup weapons to bows and pole arms. Today, we're gonna to be looking at the pole arms of the samurai era, which means by European dating, we're gonna be looking at the 10th to the 19th centuries. But briefly before we go on, a quick word from our sponsors, World of Warships, which is a game where you can play the Japanese in a battleship. I recently started playing World of Warships and it's free to download free to play is absolutely awesome great game for your pc if you like massive ships and armor and giant guns you're gonna love world of warships now i'm fairly new to the game but currently my absolute favorite ship in the game is the tier 2 cruiser it's a us cruiser called chester and i love it because it's got loads of guns and i'm absolutely loving blasting away at the enemy as mentioned world warships is absolutely free to download free to play right now on your pc and there's new content being added every month including things like new ships new classes of ships even and new paint schemes i really enjoy playing around with some of the geometric camo and the graphics are totally sweet the sea looks real the way that the trajectory of the shells go out of the guns looks so good the explosions really really good graphics there's loads of different nations to choose from and classes of ships battleships cruisers destroyers there's also submarines and aircraft carriers i haven't got that far yet but it looks awesome so if you want to give it a try right now for absolute free you can use my link in the description down below to download world of warships for free and during registration if you use the code the special code warships then you'll get you'll get extra doubloons credits premium account for a limited amount of time and also a ship to fight with so now let's get back to the main content of this video and let's talk about some of the most important and in some cases strange as well as we're going to see japanese pole arms hafted weapons shafted weapons used during the age of the samurai from the 10th all the way through to the 19th centuries so the first and most obvious and most important pole arm that was used during japanese history in those thousand years that we're talking about 900 years is the spear known as a yari so yari just translates as spear and in fact there were many varieties of spear just as they were in europe or africa or anywhere else else we look but the spear was very very important however it grew in importance at various periods initially the japanese have made extensive use of um, bows and during the mongol invasions of the uh, 13th 14th centuries this sort of period spears essentially became more important and bows slightly less important and then of course later on in the 16th century firearms came along as well and there was some use made of very long spears similar to pike blocks in europe but without going into too detailed history on the reasons and why fours and wherefores the fact is that spears were important weapons right the way through samurai history and in fact right up until the 19th century as well and used alongside bows and firearms and of course swords and swords both the katana well earlier on the tachi and then the katana or uchi katana and then the uh, wakasashi um, the shorter sword were very important backup weapons for basically everybody so while the samurai are most famous for carrying the daisho the long sword and the short sword um, in fact the the particularly the, the wakasashi was carried by all sorts of soldiers including common spearmen as well but the spear was incredibly important both for nobility, so sort of samurai, the equivalent of knights, and also for rank and file soldiers. And they varied hugely in length. Now, the heads vary of various types. Now, there are long heads and short heads, and they vary in cross section. So, again, there is a huge variety of spearheads. I would say there's more variety of spears and variations or types of yari in Japan than there was of swords and knives. Um, they're hugely, hugely varied, both in terms of the construction, the way they're attached to the shaft, in terms of the cross section of the blade, in terms of the look or silhouette of the blade, in terms of the projections, both on the blade and on the shaft. So let's look at some of those. 
So first up, the most common type of Yari come with either a short blade or a long blade. And those blades can either be what we'd call a flattened diamond section, that means a bit like a, an edged square, um, or they were triangular. Now interestingly, triangular blades were very popular in Japan. They were also popular in Europe and they were used initially on things like small swords and then later on on lances and bayonets. Now the advantage of a triangular blade, it's very good for penetrating, resisting materials. It's relatively poor at having any sort of edge. So that goes, that's true for the Japanese Yari as well. The triangular section blades, which were sometimes hollow ground, so they sometimes have a fuller on the flat face, um, they're very good for stabbing, no use at all for cutting, but in fairness a lot of them are also very short bladed as well. So they're really for penetrating, including penetrating armour of various kinds. Now these could also have long blades and they could be triangular section or either of these spears could have a flattened diamond section. And if they were flattened diamond section, in other words double edged, then they could indeed be sharpened and very often were. A lot of the most common spears were of a type that we would term the suit yari, and then there's the type with the very long blade, which we could call the omi yari, but they do go by various different terms and there's variations depending on the particular um, aspects of their design. Now another relatively common type of spearhead is called the saseo yari, and that is a, a kind of leaf-shaped blade, more like a traditional spearhead actually it would see in other parts of the world, and they were, because they are broader and therefore have a different edge geometry, very often edged. So this is a spear that will create a larger wound and that potentially you could cut with or at least draw cut or push cut with. And um, so it's going to do more damage to soft targets and non-armoured or lightly armoured people. However, it's not going to penetrate armour as well as the uh, narrow triangular section blades would. Now it's worth noting that Japanese Yari, for the most part, are usually attached to the shaft in a very different way to most spears in most of the rest of the world. That is, they have a very long tang or nakago which goes into a hole in the shaft and then to reinforce the shaft there's usually binding or um, bands of metal around the outside to stop it splitting apart and very often a metallic cap on the top as well to prevent the, the wood um, kind of exploding outwards. So a very different method of attachment and very similar actually to how swords and um, knives, tanto and, and katana and tachi are attached into the hilts. So the long tang goes inside the handle or shaft in this case and then there's a mukugi or pin which goes through the side and holds it in. This has the advantage that you can replace the shaft and replace the head very easily. It has the disadvantage, you could argue, that it's somewhat weaker than a socketed construction as used in most other parts of the world. But it's also worth mentioning that very occasionally, and these, these are relatively rare, you do get socketed heads in Japan as well. So they didn't know about that technology and they did occasionally use it, but for whatever reason, that just wasn't their standard method of attaching a Yari head to a shaft. It has been suggested that these socketed versions were known as Fukuro Yari. Fukuro means um, bag, um, and you'll, you may have encountered this term in um, Kendo or Kenjutsu, because there's a Fukuro Shinai, which is a, a bag that goes over the bamboo uh, to make a certain type of sparring implement that was a popular early type of uh, heavier um, shinai actually more representative of a, of a katana um, so this type of socketed head is rare but does exist in japan so don't let people tell you they didn't exist because they did sometimes now another form of very iconic yari that you'll very often encounter when you look at images of either original or modern of uh, samurai is the jumonji yari now the jumonji yari you some people might term it a trident. In fact, it's more similar to in what Europe, in medieval Europe, we call a winged spear. That is, it's essentially a long-bladed yari, so uh, an omi yari, with projecting blades on either side. Now, these blades are edged all around. They have several advantages. One, you can push aside or parry an opponent's weapon either the head or the shaft. So this is a bit similar to the European partisan or corsac, or, or indeed the winged spear. Very similar function, very similar motivations. The additional factor with the Jumonji Yari, the Japanese version, is that these wings are edged all around and sharp. Now in Europe, usually winged spears, partisans, things like this, usually those are not edged. An exception would be the corsac, uh, or perhaps certain forms of ransa, which do have edged ones, and it's actually very similar to the Jumonji Yari. And the advantage of having those being edged is, of course, you can run the blade up the opponent's shaft 
and offend their hand. So if you're fighting an opponent who's got a standard Yari, you can parry their shaft with yours, run your blade, your uh, lateral blade, up the shaft and slice them in the hands. Or indeed, you can go behind their arm and slice backwards. And of course, you could apply that to any other part of their body. You could go for their legs, the back of the neck, you know, round the sides of the arm and this kind of stuff. Additionally, in addition to pushing and pulling, uh, cutting or slashing, you can also hook. So you can hook pieces of equipment, a bit like how a bill hook would work in, in Europe. But in addition to that, you can also hit with it because they project out sideways. You can use it a little bit like a warhammer or a, you know, a pick or a cami or something like this. So you can hit with it as well. So you've got a whole bunch of technique options uh, with the Jumanji Yari. Now there's a very closely related weapon, which is the Katakama Yari. And again, these might go by different terms in period texts, but that's the term that's used at least most of the uh, places that I've read in, in modern literature. So the Katakama Yari is essentially like a Jumanji Yari on one side, but only has a short projection uh, on the other side sometimes possibly even no projection. So essentially we've got the Jumanji Yari is symmetrical and the asymmetrical version is the Katakama Yari which has a blade on one side. This has some benefits uh, because it means that you could use, you can do all of the things I just mentioned with the projecting blade on one side, but it's lighter because you don't have a full blade on the other side. And one of the disadvantages of any type of winged spear is those wings can get caught when you don't want them to. So the advantage of this is you can hook with one side, but by turning the weapon, the shaft in your hand, you can disengage it and pull the weapon back more easily because it's not going to get engaged, hooked on the other side when you don't want it to. Uh, you can also thrust into smaller openings, for example. So if you have two projecting blades, like on the Jumanji Yari um, or any type of winged spear, you, you can only get your blade between a, a gap that is that wide whereas if obviously if you only have a blade projector on one side and there's a gap to thrust through if you want to stab someone in the face between a gap you can get it through there so there are advantages weight and uh, convenience and, and other things to only having a blade projecting on one side and there are some famous and beautifully made surviving examples of this asymmetrical form of yari now as well as projections from the blade or in some cases the top of the socket like the jumanji yari there are also projections we sometimes find on Yari coming from the shaft. Now, these can be like a crossbar. Sometimes you'll have an asymmetrical crossbar and the other side is turned up. And these, as I understand it, these go generally under the term of Hadome. And Hadome are projections on the shaft um, attached to the Koshirai of the uh, shaft of the Yari. And these projections can do some of the things that we've just talked about the projections on the blade doing, but the difference is they're retrospect, you could retrospectively add them. So if what you've get, got is a standard Yari blade, triangular Yari blade, short Yari blade, but you want some projections, you just add them to the shaft because you can't add them to the head because the head's already been forged uh, and made. So you can add them to the shaft and these have a lot of the hooking and parrying benefits that we've just talked about the Jumanji Yari having. Um, disadvantages, a little bit more weight, more likely to get caught and snagged in things. Um, so they, I won't say that they were super common, but they weren't super rare either. And they come in a variety of different forms, some straight, some curved up, sometimes one straight, one curved up. Now the final variation with Yari, with spears that I'm going to talk about here, I'm not going to go into the terminology because it gets very complicated and there's many different Japanese terms which I'm sure I'll mispronounce. But fundamentally, Yari can come in a variety of lengths and they can vary to being really quite short. So there were uh, Yari which were put on specifically short shafts for home defense, for keeping next to your bed or uh, police use and things like this. So there were sort of almost like truncheon, baton length um, Yari. You can use the same head, you just put it on a short shaft. Up to more obvious spear length shafts, so um, samurai fighting on foot tended to use about seven foot, so usually about as high as you can reach your hand or just above your head length yari. Sometimes a bit longer than that, sometimes you know eight or nine feet tall. If they were being used as lances on horseback, there's some suggestion you'd usually put them on a longer shaft because you need to be able to reach in front of the horse's head or infantry on the ground. Um, and they go all the way up to pike length. So just as in Europe in the what would be the Muromachi period in, in Japan, so if we're looking, let's say, at the 1500s um, or into the early Edo period, um, so early 1600s, then in Europe, it was very typical for most infantry to be divided into musket troops and pike troops or spearmen, essentially. And that was the same in Japan. That's what the Japanese did as well. And in some cases, the Japanese did use 
very long yari or pikes um, up to like 18 feet long. This wasn't necessarily common in Japan. It seems that most yari were more modestly length than that, more like say 10 or 12 feet long. And in fact, individual, pe individual fighters like samurai would usually use ones that were more like seven or eight feet long. So it depends what you're going to use them for. And the shorter ones, just as in Europe, the shorter ones tend to have uh, part of the koshirai is to have a spike or some other kind of shoe on the back end. And you can use both ends liberally. Obviously, a longer pike that's 14, 16, 18 feet long, you don't really use the back end very much. You just use the front end. And if someone gets in close, you pull out your wakasashi. But um, they did use long pikes in some situations. Situations. So yari could vary hugely in length depending on what the purpose of their use was and because of the way that the yari head at least the common type with the long nakago fits into the um, shaft it does mean that you could use the same head on multiple different lengths of shaft. So the next very famous form of Japanese polearm which I'm sure anybody watching this video will know about is the naginata. Now some websites would describe this as a Japanese halberd. I don't like that term because a halberd specifically involves an axe blade. Uh, it's better described actually as a Japanese glaive. Okay so um, the European term for this if Europeans in the 16th century went to Japan they looked at it they would go it's a glaive. Essentially it's a sword on a stick. And that actually leads around to the debate of its origin. We don't really know. What we can say for sure is that after the Mongol invasions of the 1200s, uh, pole arms became more popular for various reasons. The Japanese didn't do very well against the Mongols and, and were saved by nature, uh, but they changed a lot of things in the armour, um, therefore the archery as well, and the pole arms and even the swords uh, as a result of that experience. And one of those things was that Naginata became more common. Um, it's not known whether they developed from a form of Yari, some people believe that, or whether it simply evolved from the Tachi putting on a long shaft, essentially. Putting a, someone thinking, well, let's put a sword blade on a shaft, we don't really know. But the construction is very similar to Japanese swords in that you have a long nakago or tang which inserts into a shaft much like it inserts into the um, into the suka um, and the blades are made in exactly the same way as sword blades not always the same design but the same manufacturing method usually by the same sword makers so they are expensive high status objects that being said, they were carried by both samurai and common retainers, Ashigaru. Um, and, uh, but anyway, the construction method's the same, but you have a long shaft. Now, in terms of length, they also, like Yari, they vary quite a bit, not as much as Yari. So they can, when they're fitted with the blade and the shaft, they can be below head height or they can be above head height, essentially. So a little bit similar in variation of uh, length to f European 15th century, 16th century pole axes and glaives, as it happens. So they could be used as massed weapons or individual weapons. And they, were, as I say, they were used by samurai, ashigaru, but they're also used by sohei or uh, monks, basically, um, Buddhist monks. So, uh, and later on, famously used by a certain class of um, warrior women as well. Um, and they have survived this, methods of use have survived to some extent in modern Kenjutsu uh, Ryu, but also in um, Naginata um, Jitsu, um, or as an offshoot of Kendo, essentially. So, um, the Naginata was a different, slight, fills a slightly different place on the battlefield to the Yari. So the Yari is longer and is I would say more appropriate to massed soldier use, um, whereas you require more space to use a naginata. Because necessarily a naginata is a cut and thrust weapon, uh, with a blade varying usually between 30 and 60 centimetres, um, so a foot to two feet um, for the imperial measurement people out there. Um, it's essentially like a wakasashi blade on a stick and so if you're going to slash with it, I mean you can do push cuts and draw cuts, but if you're going to chop with it for example you need quite a bit of space around you to move. So you can't pack lots of troops into a small space and expect them to use <coughs> naginata to their full potential, whereas you could do with pikes or you know yari essentially. Um, so the naginata came in various different forms, but actually it kind of didn't change design that much from when it came into common usage, let's say in the 13th century, right the way through to the 19th century. Um, 
it didn't change an awful lot. Sometimes they got a bit thinner, sometimes they got a bit longer, sometimes the cross section of the blade is a bit different, but there is a very common cross section of blade. Um, where part of the blade at the back is beveled off. And funnily enough, this was so popular on Naginata that this was actually emulated on Tachi and later Uchigadana and uh, Wakisashi and even Tanto of the day. And this cross section is named after the Naginata because it's a, a famously associated with the Naginata cross section. The advantage of it is it removes some mass. So don't think that the Naginata is a heavy pole arm. It's not at all. It's actually a very light and quick pole arm. Very light blade. By a lot of European standards, this is quite a light blade. Although, in fairness, you could compare it to 15th and 16th century glaives in Europe, which are also um, pretty light weapons. There are obviously except, um, comparisons to be made with Chinese glaives of the same period, but Chinese glaives are really quite a different design. Much broader, thinner blades, I think for slightly different purposes, um, but that's a topic for another video. But the Japanese Naginata was, as I say, was used by both samurai, common soldiers occasionally, and warrior monks famously. And it's also worth mentioning what a versatile weapon the Naginata was, and in most situations would overwhelm a sword wielder because of the greater reach and leverage. And it was used on foot, obviously. It was also used on horseback, and it was used on board ships as well. Now the next Japanese pole arm, which I feel I have to mention, and often gets overlooked on lists of Japanese pole arms, is the humble bow, bow staff, the staff, the quarter staff, just a stick <laughs> and essentially the bow is actually incredibly important for a couple of a couple of reasons firstly being a stick you could wander around with it so just as in europe there were in japan there were legal restrictions at various times and places on carriage of weapons particularly if you were not of a noble um, social class and a stick is an omnipresent thing i mean it could be a handle on a tool it could in some cases be a tool and I also want to mention that in passing, we know categorically that tools like hose, like garden hose for, uh, for tilling the land, were used as weapons in Japan, just as they were in Europe. Because obviously, farmers in the fields, if they have to get a weapon, they'll just use the nearest tool to hand. So the bow was very important because it was legally omnipresent. You can't get rid of sticks from the world. Sticks are used as tools, they're just everywhere, okay? That's the first reason. The second reason is because within martial arts training, training to use the bow staff teaches you to use the pole arms. So a lot of people would have practiced to um, use a yari in war or single combat or a naginata or any of the other pole arms we're looking at here by practicing with the bow staff. So if you look at the practice weapon that's used in naginata jutsu, it is a bow staff with a bamboo blade added on the end to simulate the blade of the naginata. But nevertheless, Physically, the, move, the movements and the techniques that you do with the bow staff are really similar and really interlaced with the techniques of all the other pole arms because they're all big sticks. Now, before we jump into the rarer Japanese pole arms, because you have to bear in mind the Yari and the Naginata are throughout this period the predominant pole arms used by um, the samurai and their retainers, I just want to give an honorable mention to the Nagamaki. Now, this is in my mind, really a sword. So this is essentially where they got a sword blade and added a really long handle to it. And for that reason, I'm not really including it in this list, but I know that if I don't mention it, then some of you will say, you forgot it. Um, and really just to say the reason I haven't gone into more depth on it is because I consider it a sword with a long hilt rather than really a pole arm. So the next weapon to mention is the Kanabo. And this comes in various forms that is essentially a metal and iron shod or completely metal mace. Let's call it a mace, okay? And they vary in length. Um, they can be sort of like baseball bat or truncheon sized all the way up to sort of quarter staff size. Um, if they're made of wood, they're usually iron shod. I guess sometimes they use uh, brass as well, but they're usually with studs um, or uh, yeah, projections on them. And sometimes they can be made entirely of iron as well. Uh, these are associated with the Oni and they're used in mythology um, and they're regarded as heavy weapons that um, strike with a lot of force. In reality, they were probably used in a very similar array of reasons and situations as in medieval Europe. That is, sometimes they were a non or lethal or less than lethal uh, weapon choice for law enforcement um, or other 
sorts of retainers, but sometimes they were used as an anti-armor weapon. So obviously as armor got better in Japan, just like it did in Europe as well, weapons had to evolve to deal with it. And what was discovered was that, you know, you can't always cut through armor, you can't always thrust through it, but if you just hit someone really hard with a heavy object, no matter how good the armor is, a lot of that energy will transfer through to them, especially if you hit them in the head or the knee. Um, so. Um, these sorts of maces, kind of, I won't say that they were ever hugely common, but they equally they appear in art across a broad period and there are surviving examples as well. So these were a weapon, essentially the, the studded club um, or mace, they were a weapon that was absolutely part of the uh, sort of samurai period um, from the from the 10th to the 19th centuries in Japan and used in a variety of different um, scenarios. Now the next Japanese pole arm a lot of people don't even know exists. It's called the Masakari in Japanese. In fact there are other names used as well for an axe. Now uh, various people are under the impression that axes weren't used in Japan but if you look through Japanese manuscripts, you will see them shown. Now, part of this is because there's a lot of mythological characters um, and stories where axes were used. But in addition to that, we have surviving Japanese axes, number one, of various sorts, and I'll come back to that in a second. In addition to that, we also have written records from the 14th, 15th, 16th centuries of axes being used in warfare. Uh, now, this is uh, surprising to lots of people, and I think it's no coincidence that particularly in the 14th century as well, we have uh, armor being used of a particularly heavy level. It's before gunpowder came in. So in Japan, just like in Europe, armor had reached its kind of uh, apex, you could say, in this period. And probably, therefore, they were looking at weapons like the axe and the mace to overcome uh, and different types of yari head as well, to overcome the armor more effectively. Of course, in the, you could say in the end, late 15th, but really in the 16th century, gunpowder becomes a major thing. Uh, and that kind of changes everything because at that point, there's no point making heavier and heavier armor if people are shooting bullets at you. But um, in this period, the 14th to 16th century, you do find axes used. Now, as I say, the Masakari come in various different styles. Some of them look a little bit tomahawk-like. Some of them even have heart-shaped holes in the blade. Some of them have, uh, projections on both sides, so essentially po uh, uh, an axe blade and a smaller axe blade or a, a point on the back side. Um, and there's even uh, a surviving, couple of surviving examples with an axe blade with essentially a yari point, a spear point to the top. So it seems like in this period, just like in medieval and Renaissance Europe, people were playing around with combining different weapons to come up with better options for overcoming armor of the day. In terms of length, we know that some of these were only one-handed, but I've included them in the polearm list because we absolutely know from the art that some of these were long, at least poleaxe length, and sometimes even longer, um, almost halberd-like types of axes. So absolutely, although they weren't common, because of course, wood chopping axes were extremely common in, in Japan, uh, used for, for, for felling trees and, and, and you know woodcraft, so it would be weird in a way if we didn't find a weapon equivalent of these uh, developed for the battlefield, and, and we do. They're just not widely known until now, hopefully. Now this weapon is, I, I was slightly reluctant to include it, but I, it's an interesting one, so I couldn't, uh, I couldn't ignore it completely. It's the Nanti Bow. Now this seems to have been essentially a Chinese import. It's essentially a sai attached to the end of a pole, and it seems to have achieved some popularity in Okinawa um, for all of the kind of particular cultural reasons that some things in Okinawa are different to mainstream Japan. And it seems to come from China in the Ming Dynasty. Um, as many things did, we even find Chinese forms of glaive sometimes in uh, Japanese art so, and descriptions. So it's likely that some Chinese weapons were coming to Japan. And we certainly know that lots of Japanese blades were finding their way into Ming Dynasty China, as I've talked about in previous videos and the uh, Chinese imported large quantities of Japanese blades and at various points there were uh, prohibitions on exporting um, blades to the, to the Chinese. So, international trade, sometimes you end up with things which aren't necessarily part of Japanese development, they're kind of imported and that seems to be what the Nanti bow is. In terms of how it used, probably um, pretty much like a, a yari, it's essentially a, a spike on a stick, but with these projections. So actually in functionality, 
If we were looking at forms of Yari which have projections like the Jumonji Yari or ones which have projections on the shaft, you could use them in the same way as this. And my, suspe my suspicion, particularly in Okinawa, is that the Nantibo was essentially a poor man's Yari. It was a cheap object you could stick on a pole and you've got a functional weapon. It's not as good quality, as well made as the uh, traditional Japanese forms, but it will still get the job done. And to finish off, it's actually a set of three weapons that fit into one category. And that is a category known as, I'm gonna to have to read it, the Torimono Sandogu, which are essentially three weapons used during the Edo period um, in cities predominantly for arresting and controlling people. So essentially they're law enforcement weapons, but they are pole arms. Um, and they do have related forms which were perhaps used in uh, war as well. So the three forms that they come in is essentially a form of fork, a form of um, man catcher, and a form of pushing device. Now the first of those, the Sukobu, I think it's called, is the pushing device is a little bit like the studded staff or studded club um, that we've looked at, the uh, cannibal, but it has a T-section end. And it's quite obvious, you just look at it, it's for pushing people, but it has a bound end. So if they're using a knife, wakasashi, or a longer sword, katana, um, then you can, they can slash at the shaft and it's not going to cut through it. And you can um, push them quite effectively with it. And also, if you need to, you can subdue them, you can donk them with it. Next up is the sodegarami. And this is developed from a Chinese, very similar Chinese uh, weapon that ironically, allegedly, was developed to fight against Japanese pirates. Um, but it became adopted by the Japanese and was used for law enforcement. This involves a essentially um, forked prongs at the end, hooks that go back, spikes at the side, and a lot of these are barbed as well. And the whole intention of this is to control, subdue, and also entangle, and that's very important. So you have to think about the, the clothing that was being worn um, by people at the time, and because of all the barbs and the hooks and the spikes, you could essentially get it tangled up in the opponent's uh, clothing and body in some cases, and it would help to control them. And bearing in mind that they would very often be armed with a sword or a knife, if they're slashing away, they won't be able to reach you because it's a pole arm. They'll be tangled up, so they might their movements might be impeded, and you've got your mates there to help out as well. Um, and of course, the end of the shaft is reinforced by iron and langettes to protect against the slashes and cuts. And the final one is the Sasumata, which is essentially a crescent. There are very similar weapons in China, and it's very likely that these came from China. China, or at least were inspired by uh, similar ones, or it could have been convergent evolution. It's not 100% certain. My personal belief is they were probably copied from Chinese ones um, that are older. But nevertheless, they're similar to the European man catcher. They're actually a bit simpler than the European man catcher. Uh, but then again, because we've got a set of three weapons here, the European man catcher tries to be a jack of all trades and combine all aspects of these three into one thing. The Japanese had three separate weapons for law enforcement and control. Uh, but essentially, this is a crescent uh, blade uh, with a reinforced shaft, reinforced for the aforementioned reasons to protect against cuts, slashes, breaking, this kind of stuff. And the blade is there to essentially either go around someone's neck or around someone's arm or leg, but basically to pin them to a wall or a tree or the ground uh, to stop them moving in conjunction with the other weapons being used here. So we've got these three really cool weapons um, that are not really designed for war, um, could potentially be used in war, but are primarily designed for law enforcement, particularly in an environment where there's access to a lot of bladed weapons. So you need to develop special, less than lethal control weapons that are gonna be able to deal with a person who's armed with a sword or a knife. So there we are, I've gone through, I think a good spread of some of the huge variety of Japanese pole arms that were used in this era. There are probably ones I've neglected. I know there are forms of flail um, that I have avoided because I couldn't find very concrete uh, evidence for their history uh, and use and things like that. Uh, but are there any others that I've missed? As always, I completely welcome your contributions down below. Uh, maybe there's some weapons I've missed, maybe some weird and wonderful weapons that would make a great standalone video in the future by themselves. But I think I've covered the main ones. And really just to reiterate, that while axes, contrary to popular belief, were used in Japan, and while there were studded, sharp, you know, kind of staff or mace and things like this used in Japan, and they're not widely known either, 
the predominant pole arms used in Japanese history, certainly um, from the sort of Kamakura period um, onwards, were the Yari and the Naginata. And ironically, they're a little bit different to each other because the Naginata didn't really change much and didn't have enormous variety. Yes, some had shorter shafts and some had longer ones, some had longer blades, some shorter blades, but they didn't vary hugely amongst Naginata. They seem to have perfected the design and then just stuck with it. Whereas the Yare comes in a huge variety from little short home defense versions to massive great long pikes to everything in between, wide blades, narrow blades, long blades, short blades, triangular section, flattened diamond section, projecting blades, asymmetrical projecting blades, and projecting um, parts on the shaft as well sometimes with uh, butt spikes and this kind of stuff. So a huge variety of Yari, and we should really say, just as in most of the world, the spear or Yari was absolutely the most important pole weapon throughout Japanese history. And we could say in many ways, maybe not culturally, but actually on the battlefield more important than the sword, um, used on horseback or on foot. But that Japan also loved the Naginata, and that's one of the reasons why the Naginata has survived in modern martial arts practice um, and sports today. Um, and unlike in Europe, where the glaive was just one of many roughly similar types of pole weapon, the Naginata seems to have covered a, a great spectrum of um, uh, pole arm use particularly for individual use for samurai, for example, fighting on foot um, in, in Japan. So the Naginata and the Yari, absolutely the most important weapon categories or pole arm categories in Japanese history. I hope this has been um, interesting to watch and thanks once again to World of Warships for sponsoring this video. Remember, it's free to download, free to play. There's the link right below down there in the description. You can get downloading and playing World of Warships and blasting enemy uh, warships right now. It's great fun, give it a go. Um, and remember that special code as well, um, Warships, which will give you um, extra bonuses once you're in game. Thanks a lot for watching. I have been Matt Easton and I will hopefully continue to be and I hope that you have liked and subscribed and I'll see you back on the channel really soon for another video. Cheers, folks.